nutrients generally means the things that you, you get from your food or things that uh, you get from your own gut bacteria. So anything that is nourishing to you, anything that helps you to grow, to regenerate, to heal and repair. Welcome to another episode of Shift with Shubra, and I am your host, Shubra Vanetti, and this is a conversation with um, different practitioners from various aspects of health and wellness modalities, and today's guest is one of my favorite people, actually all my guests are all my favorite people really, but uh, speaking to this, this guest particularly sort of sparked a lot of interest in getting the idea behind this podcast going and her name is Catherine Koo. She is the founder of Aman Wellness and Catherine is a nutritional therapist. So a little background about Catherine um, is that after almost 20 years of a hectic corporate lifestyle with various multinationals, the stressful imbalanced lifestyle took a toll on her health and indigestion, allergies, acne, constant fatigue were just some of the common health issues that she was facing. And on realizing that the medications helped to alleviate the symptoms, but they didn't provide an actual cure or reversal of her conditions. And that's when she decided that she wanted to search for an alternative method to get to the bottom of her issues. And in doing so, she discovered the science of nutritional medicine and she recognizes that it's not as easy to maintain a good health and you know maintain certain things especially given the modern society of day that we live in today so we all value good health is what she thinks and yet at the same time we need to create a way of living that will, you know, not damage our health instead and instead support and make it, you know, better. Her philosophy goes on to say that, you know, we usually shortchange uh, on a healthy diet and we ignore our body's messages of pain and fatigue. Um, I'm basically, you know, I've, I've been a client of Catherine's as well, not just obviously because of this podcast, but once we first had our first conversation about nutritional therapy and what it was, I was really intrigued since I have been suffering from chronic chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia, um, or at least have, they suspect it is, is the common, is the short answer because there's no actual determining tests that are as conclusive as, as ever for chronic fatigue syndrome but the the symptomatic sort of test that they have available has you know basically come back positive in my case and on top of that I've you know I think for almost one in every two to three people I've known all of us have some sort of digestive or gut issues so in my postpartum sort of time frame, I've consulted with Catherine al- among all these other health practitioners that you'll be sort of seeing on this podcast in trying to get my health uh, going well again. And hence, that's why, you know, using Catherine's methods, I have become so much better. And it is, as I would, from a personal experience, is to understand that while Western medicine helps, as she says, alleviate symptoms, sometimes getting to the root cause can be a slightly longer journey, but it is a better journey because you're attacking it right at the root and removing the weed that is causing the problem in your overall health. I wanted to bring Catherine on today to give us some information that, you know, maybe as a layman, it's not commonly known so i'm going to ask her some questions of some terms that are usually thrown around in the health and wellness sort of space and as a patient you know to doctors in general um these sort of terminologies and these sort of concepts are always thrown around but to be very honest i didn't really understand you know in depth what these terms were and hence I wanted to get someone like Catherine in today to share a bit more information so that in the future should you come across these sort of terms or advice you know going forward with your medical practitioner you know 
what uh, they are talking about so that you can make an informed decision going forward. So without any delay, let's get Catherine on for this podcast. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. As you know, I think our conversation two years ago sort of sparked this whole like, wow, this could open up so many realms of conversations on health and wellness um, that I think people should be having these days. I, I think I'm going to start off with one of the questions that I first asked you when I met you itself. And I remember a common friend called Cheryl, who will I will also be interviewing um, or have interviewed, de- depending on when this podcast falls, um, uh-huh. about chronic illnesses. But um, Cher- when I asked Cheryl about nutrition, she gave mm-hmm. your name and she did say nutritional therapist. But in my head, I was like, oh, a nutritionist. And then mm-hmm. I was like, so what is a nutritionist? And you're like, I'm not a nutritionist. I'm a nutritional therapist. And I'm like, <laughs> great. <all> friends. <laughs> what is the difference? Yes, please enlighten us. Okay. Um, let me try to make it as short as and clear as possible. It's not always easy to do that, but okay. Um, generally, a nutritionist would advise people on how to eat healthy, how to have a balanced diet, balanced meal, uh, what's good food, what's bad food. Uh, for a nutritional therapists, we, we look at a person holistically and we believe that whatever you eat uh, affects your, your whole being. So it affects your mental uh, health, it affects your heart health, your gastrointestinal health. So if you eat the wrong thing, it affects everything. And if you eat the right thing, then you are allowing your body a chance to heal. So we, we look at nutrition as a holistic uh, element rather than just healthy eating and, you know, So, yes, so that's why we look at, we use nutrients as a way, or nutrition, whether it's from your diet or whether it's from supplements, as a way to reverse your disease or manage your symptom. Because your body can do that. Your body can heal itself. That's our belief. Okay. So, when you say that more holistic or sort of just beyond the nutritional, or just beyond the nutrition of the food that's going into you, what other elements are you looking at? Uh, Nutrition. Nutrients will affect everything about you, from your hormone balance to uh, to your mental health, to your physical health. So, if you have, um, say, if you have a certain chronic disease and you're trying to manage the symptom, so we will use nutrients to specifically help you to manage them, to help you to reverse or manage the symptoms. So it's not just about healthy eating, whatever the nutrition that you're taking, it's um, it's personalized. It's really personalized to your health condition. So what you are eating may be healthy for you because of a certain health condition, but it is generally may not be a healthy diet for another person. Right. Yeah. So okay. it's not a generic healthy diet per se. It's a very, uh, we're using nutrients as a way to treat as a way, I wouldn't say treat as a way to allow your body to heal itself as a way to replenish your body, make sure that they have the, uh, they have the necessary uh, nourishment so that they can start healing itself. Okay, so now let's dive deeper into this because you mentioned the word nutrients and I think sometimes people throw these terms, right? Oh, vitamins and minerals <laughs> and nutrients. What in really, like, I don't think anyone actually knows besides vitamin C, maybe, you know, sometimes vitamin A, but like, or vitamin D or vitamin E oil, but no one really knows what the difference is between a vitamin, a mineral and a nutrient. And does a nutrient include vitamins and minerals into that? Or are they just separate things? Like what, can you break those three terms down? Nutrients are, nutrients generally means the things that you, you get from your food or things that uh, you get from your own gut bacteria so anything that is nourishing to you anything that helps you to grow to regenerate to heal and repair okay so that's nutrient so under the umbrella of nutrient you have vitamins you have minerals uh, you have your carbohydrates your fiber your protein your f- good fats so all those are considered nutrients right okay so it's a giant umbrella yeah so when someone just everything. Right, so when someone just throw the term nutrients, it could mean 
anything. <laughs> right? Exactly. Like, oh, these are full of nutrients. Like, which one? I don't even know what that's supposed to mean. Correct. Okay. So it's a term that is very widely used. Everybody would say, eat a nutritious food. What do you mean by nutritious food? Do you mean you need more vitamins? Which type of vitamins or minerals? What type of minerals? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And then and then you're saying that things like, you know, fats are inside that, carbohydrates are part of that, proteins are part of that. Yes. Like that's a huge that's a plethora of different items that are yes. encompassed. Correct. In that. And generally for nutrients, there are those that uh internally we can produce them. Whether our gut bacteria produces the nutrients for us or our own body can actually produce the nutrients for us. And there's also a group of nutrients like vitamins and minerals that we cannot produce at all. Mm. Yeah, it has to come from our food, with the exception of vitamin uh, D and B12. Everything else generally cannot be produced. So you okay. need it. Yeah. So you need to eat those from food. And if your food is, quote unquote, not nutritious, it does not have enough vitamins or minerals, then that's when you run into deficiencies. Okay, so let's talk about specifically vitamins and minerals. What is the difference, major difference between these two? Uh, of course, chemically, they are two different chemical, biochemical products. Uh, okay, I was term. really not a good <laughs> science student. Um, yeah. I barely passed. So you can just look at it like, oh, they are two very different group of uh, biochemical uh, elements right? Okay. So you have one group that is called vitamins and another group that is called minerals. Now, um, vitamins generally can be produced by plants mm -hmm. yeah, uh, or animals or, uh, or usually it's, it's, it's actually by plants more, so more than animals. So um, except for vitamin C, for example, uh, some animals can produce vitamin C, but for humans, we cannot produce that. Okay. Yeah, so different... Have to ingest it. Correct. So uh, different animals, different plants, they, will, they can produce different type of vitamins. So when we eat a combination of different plants like vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds, and uh, different types of meats, we get all the different types of vitamins. Right, okay. Right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but the, for any type of nutrient to be categorized under vitamin, the general um, scientific understanding is that particular nutrient cannot be produced by the human body. Okay. It can be produced by an animal, but cannot be produced by the human body. Right. And for a human, we must ingest it from our food. Then it will go under the category of vitamins. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, and, and on top mm. of that, number one, it cannot be produced by a human. And the second thing is, uh, if we don't eat enough of it, uh, we will uh, slowly degenerate. Okay. So basically, vitamins also then contribute to the regeneration factor or regeneration processes in yes. our body. Yes. Okay. So, so it's vi of... vital for healing. Correct. For it's vital for healing. So a lot of... Um, aging, regeneration, breaking down of certain of our body parts, of our organs. That, that is why a lot of those are linked back to vitamins deficiency. Because mm. without that, you're not really regenerating very well. Okay. All right. And so then minerals are... Minerals come minerals? from the soil. <laughs> okay. Okay. They are naturally occurring uh, on planet Earth. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they can uh, occur... Um, in the air and then when rain comes they will be uh, carried down by the rain into the soil but generally they are in the soil and the plants will absorb them from the soil and when we or our all the animals eat the plants that's where we get the minerals from mm. so they are not made by anybody they are found natural in the in environment the in the soil and that's where we get it from now, if the farming practices are terrible, let's say you go to a certain location and they don't take care of the soil, and there's a lot of erosion, they have over-farmed and all the minerals have been used up, 
So now the vegetables, the fruits, the nuts and seeds would have a lower amount of minerals and that will affect us directly. Right. Yeah. Okay. So can you give me an example of something that, so then organic farming is going to be thrown into this conversation somewhere where do you think organic farming is what is better than to, to consume vegetables that come from orga organic farming methods? Uh, organic farming, biodiversity, where they try okay. to replenish the soil back. Yeah, so those type of farming techniques, um, or definitely the produce will be richer in minerals. Right. Okay. And it's only in plants that these minerals come into, like animals will not necessarily have this, or it will be watered down because they would consume, consume the plants. And then even yes. if we take it from animal protein, it's going to be, you know, one, one thousandth of the percentage of. Not necessary. <laughs> not necessary because okay. the animals could be eating a lot of the plants. Right. Right. Yeah? So like herbivores, they will be eating a lot of grass. So mm. they are gathering the minerals from there. So that's why when we eat uh, the animals, we will also get the minerals from there. But it wouldn't be as high in content compared to just ingesting the vegetables directly? Uh, not really, not necessary either because most of our minerals are stored in us. So as we, uh, especially in our bones. Mm -hmm. okay. Our bones, for human, our bones are a mineral storage. Apart from being the frame, yeah. Being our human frame, uh, and apart from the you know the structural frame, uh, our bones is also our mineral storage. Mm, okay. So whenever we run low on minerals, the bones will release the minerals. Ah, okay. So it's like our backup reserve for minerals. Yes. Okay. Okay. But then, okay. So going then into things like the deficiencies, right? Because how would we even know at this point without, I mean, I would imagine the best way to know is through a blood test, um, specifically trying to determine if you have deficiencies in certain minerals or vitamins. Is that the best way or accurate way to find out? Uh, blood test is not the most accurate way. Oh, okay. Okay, because you don't really test your vitamins and minerals when you do a blood test, right? So mm -hmm. there are other uh, better ways, for example, like uh, hair. Yeah. For minerals. Okay. Yeah. Uh, or stool test sometimes. Hair for minerals. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, unless you are a trained, um, unle yeah, unless you are a trained therapist or trained physician, then by looking at your blood test, together with your symptoms, together with your dietary habits, then you will get, then you'll be able to determine which mineral is uh, deficient. Mm, so you okay. have to look at it holistically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because there are obviously, you know, like family members are like, oh, I had my blood test. I'm all fine. And I'm like, if you were all fine, you would not be having, you know, X, Y, Z still problems yes. that you were <laughs> doing medication for. So clearly you are not fine, right? Like, yes. quote unquote, which is why I wanted to know what is the best determining factors for people to understand that, oh, maybe I should be going to a nutritional therapist, getting other tests done. So for example, if you say like a hair would be able to indicate minerals, yeah. but yeah. what else could do it? Like, as you said, stool tests. Uh, there are some symptoms that you can uh, that you will notice. Of course, again, you have to find out from this person's diet what do they normally eat and all that. But there are some symptoms. For example, if someone is low in zinc, mm. uh, which is very common nowadays, <laughs> surprisingly very common. So when someone is low in zinc, for example, you will not. They will always. They will have very weak nails. The nails will ah. crack a lot. Okay. All right. Okay. And uh, yeah. they might have a very poor, poor digestive system. They find it very difficult to digest the food. They eat very little. Uh, so okay. these are little, little symptoms that you will notice when it comes to zinc deficiency. So every different deficiencies, there are, there are some symptoms or there are some signs that you will see in the blood test. But in the blood test, let's just say, um, let's say, Selenium deficiency. Okay, what's selenium? Right. Selenium is a type of uh, It's a type of minerals. Okay. All right. 
So let's say there is selenium deficiency. You won't see in a blood test because you don't test selenium in your blood test. Mm. Right? But you may notice that, oh, this person has a thyroid issue, the thyroid reading is out, uh, certain reading has certain reading in the thyroid is out, certain reading. So there are certain patterns that you will see that will tell us that, yeah, uh, coupled with a history of what this person is having, the other symptoms, then it will tell us that, oh, yes, this person has selenium deficiencies. Yeah. So it's a, it's a holistic thing. It's not a one, uh, it's not as easy as just looking at a blood test and say, I'm all fine, or I'm very bad. <laughs> Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, so the various of testing that a nutritional therapist might ask a person to do, depending on the system, like their symptoms, but the variation could be a specific blood test, maybe a stool test, urine test, possibly, if it needs yeah, to be. Possibly, if it needs to be yeah. hair test, stool test. Uh, mm. We can't order a blood test here in Singapore. So mm. we, don't, we don't do a blood test in Singapore. But if the client has existing blood tests, and they would, uh, I, we, for at least for me, I would normally ask for a copy just to have a, a look at it to see if there's yeah. anything. Yeah. And is it relatively easy to get these tests done? Like if at the request of a nutritional therapist, is it relatively easy? Because obviously I think most people being like me before, you just go to a doctor and then they would do tests or tell you where to go and get it done yes. in their clinic or the hospital. Um, but being a nutritional therapist, it's especially for you because you have your own based home based business essentially, right? Because or your own office based business, but it's not in a hospital per se. Yep. So where would you? Where would we have to go for testing then? If it's, it's a if it's a urine test or a hair mineral test, uh, yeah, we can run it because the test kits the client will take the test kits home. Oh. Right, and okay. then they will collect the urine or or swap, mm -hmm. depending on what they're doing, or swap the saliva test, uh, or cut a little bit of their hair for hair tests, and then uh, some. Then our courier will go over and collect mm. the kits okay. from them. Mm. Yeah, so it's simple. But uh, for blood tests, it's usually from the client's uh, own yearly checkup with their own medical doctors. Mm. Yeah. Or specifically, they go to like a blood testing lab. There are some path labs, I'm guessing, around that would do that. Essentially, yeah. If they yes, if they want to do yes, if they want to go to a path lab, they can do that too. How would someone could someone tell if they were having a mineral or vitamin deficiency of some kind? Like, are there any indicators per se? Because everyone's ready to like pop a pill to think like, oh, I've got a vitamin. I'm taking my vitamins, but like what vitamins <laughs> how would they know like right uh based on our modern diet and also a lot of our modern agri agricultural farming techniques yeah most of us today which is why zinc deficiency is so common magnesium deficiency is so common most of us today would have some form of deficiencies right, right? Okay. yeah uh, it may not be necessarily extreme uh, but there would be some uh, deficiencies. So if if anyone were to ask me that they have never get themselves tested, they do not know what deficiency or excess they have, uh, but they are kind of worried because the diet is not balanced. Uh, you just grab whatever you can, just pop, eat whatever you can. Then I would advise just get a multivitamin. That would be the safest. Okay. Yeah, you will get all the necessary a multivitamin and uh, maybe omega-3 fish oil. That would also be good. Uh, just a normal dose. Don't buy the standalone, uh, like zinc standalone, selenium standalone, magnesium standalone, unless you are sure you have a deficiency. Okay. And how long could you do something like over supplementation? You can. You can. I have seen, um, I have seen people who is taking like 15 different types of supplements. Yeah. And that is really overdoing it uh, because what happened is sometimes if you're not trained to look at a different formula, you just add, okay, I got this for my bones. Then I got this for my, I don't know, for my brain Eyes. and I got <laughs> this multivitamin. So if you just add, um, there could be certain nutrients, certain vitamins or certain minerals that occur in every single formula. Mm. Right, and at the end of the day, you're overdosing yourself with with that particular vitamins or minerals that is occurring in 
every single 15 bottles. <laughs> yeah. And then what happens if you do over supply yourself? Like, is there any dangers to that? It, it can be dangerous. Uh, certain minerals, uh, especially trace minerals, uh, you, there, there can be a toxic level if you overdo it. What is a trace mineral? Like, what's uh, an example like of a trace? Zinc. Things like mm. zinc, yeah? Uh, so there is a certain amount uh, that you, can, you must not exit over a long period of time, over several months. You don't want to go through that unless you are carefully monitored by a trained physician or a therapist. Right? Okay, right. right. And another thing is, especially when it comes to minerals, they can antagonize each other. Okay. All right? So if someone is having a very high, constantly eating food that is very high in calcium, mm. let's say, for example, um, four glasses, four to five glasses of milk a day. I don't think anybody does that, but I, I'm just giving an extreme example. Four to five glasses of milk every day and they don't eat any vegetables. Let's just say, and then they eat a lot of animal meat, animal protein. They eat a lot of um, cheese. Right, right. So lots of dairy so, as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the overload of calcium from the dairy could suppress magnesium. It could reduce your magnesium level. Right. Then you will have magnesium deficiencies and you will probably notice that blood pressure is going up, probably mm. notice that uh, muscle cramps, muscle seems to be very tight. Difficulty so, yeah. sleeping, for yes. sure. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. So, all this overloading on one type of minerals can cause other minerals to be deficient. Mm. So you have to be, yeah. So... On your diet side, it has to be like, yeah, you eat a, a general, colorful, we always say general, colorful diet. Like a balanced diet. That's yeah. the, one of the just, reasons just why don't it has stick, to be balanced. Yeah, just don't stick to one and just say that I like that. So I'm just eating that for the rest of my life. Mm, okay. Can you do, can that happen also with vitamins as well? Like we talked about minerals, but could you have a toxicity to a overdoing of a vitamin? Yes, you can. Uh, especially oil-based vitamins like uh, A, vitamin A. Right. Yeah, vitamin A, vitamin... So far, we know it's vitamin A. La. Okay. Uh, it, it can be toxic uh, if you ingest it in high amount and you overload. But water-based vitamins like vitamin C and B, uh, not really because it's water-based and it gets flushed out very quickly. Okay, so you yeah. could never have too much vitamin C. Uh, you you can, but there's no yeah. real danger except uh, diarrhea. <laughs> mm, could it affect that, your kidneys or uh, liver no. function because of no? Okay, because you're flushing so, it out. Yeah, you're flushing. Yes, I've I've uh, I've seen articles and I've seen comment that uh, if you eat high, if you ingest high doses of vitamin C, you could get a kidney stone. No, it does not. Uh, it only happens if you inject vitamin C. I see. Yeah. Okay. If you inject right. vitamin C um, at very high doses, above 30 grams, not milligrams, but grams. Yeah? Then it's, uh, it could potentially cause a kidney stone of some kind. Yes. But right. if you're just in, ingesting it, uh, there's no way anyone can take 30 grams anyway. I think by five or six grams, that person will be riding to the toilet. Right. Okay. Because it flushes out so quickly. <laughs> Right. Okay. Wow. That's so fascinating. So like in terms of diets, because you did say like a balanced diet or like a colorful diet. Now everyone is on some different type of diets these days, yes, right? Yes. So <laughs> I mean, I have a very interesting family background where all my family members, practically, my husband is vegetarian. He only okay. consumes egg sometimes. But other than that, really, that's like rarity. He's a vegetarian and Indian vegetarian, that too. Mm -hmm. um, so they still take, you know, milk and, and cheese and stuff. It's fine, um, right? And then, you know, I have other family members <laughs> or people like me who eat pretty much everything in a way. <laughs> like, um, I'm not averse to anything. I don't really like fish, but that's my personal choice and preference. And then I have other friends, for example, who are pescatarian. So they eat vegetables and they eat fish, but they don't eat red meats or lean meats. Um, is there 
I mean, I, I, I don't, I'm guessing that it doesn't, there's no one right diet for everyone anyway, because we all have yes. different body constitutions. Right. But is it better to find out what diet is best for our body type, or we just go with whatever diet we have, and then we supplement to it? If your diet is uh, relatively balanced, as in you're eating, for example, in general, eh? does not matter whether you are a vegan or a vegetarian or a uh, or, or keto diet or, you know, a lot of different diets in the market. Mm. Um, at the end of the day, every diet has a different pro and con. Mm. Every diet has its own benefits, uh, but at the same time, it could also have some uh, deficiency in certain things. Yeah. Yeah. So the first thing that I would normally tell my client is, doesn't matter which diet you want to go on. Maybe, maybe it's due to your religion or your faith that you have to go on a certain diet. It's fine. Nobody's saying that a diet is bad. So it does not really matter which diet you have to go on. But at the end of the day, you just have to make sure that you eat enough um, of the proteins, enough of the good fats, enough of the carbohydrates, enough mm. of vegetables. Yeah. So regardless, um, but if you find that you don't eat enough, let's say, uh, what is enough? Let's say vegetables. So I will always ask people to look at the vegetables amount first because that's where all your minerals is going to come from. Right. Right. Okay. Um, so that is the most balanced way to get minerals. La. So mm. if you look at your vegetables um, and you ask yourself, do you eat like six servings a day? Six servings? Who yeah. eats six servings? <laughs> Should we be eating six servings? Yeah, six servings. Oh. Do you eat like six servings a day of vegetables? Uh, if you do, it does not matter whether it is um, stir-fried or steamed or cooked in a curry or, you know, it does not matter. But as long as in total, there is six servings. I just want to make this clear because normally when I say six servings of vegetables, everybody's thinking of salad. Like nobody eats six. No, you don't have, it doesn't have to be salad. It could be you blend it in the morning green juice or, you know, any forms. But as long as okay. it's six servings a day, um, yeah, then you are relatively okay if you don't want the supplements. But if you don't get that amount, uh, then yes, you may want to think about supplementing a multivite, a multiminerals. Okay. What about vitamins? Like, I'm not a big fruit person, like, at all, really. I can drink it, as you know, but I'm not big, like, eating it. So what, what do I do? <laughs> uh, vitamins generally would come from uh, fresh vegetables and some fruits. Okay. Right? Okay. So, uh, so the general rule, I would say, is about six servings of vegetables, uh, one to two servings of fruits. Okay. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you will have uh, protein. Now your protein yeah. can come from uh, plant-based, it's fine. Or it can come from animal protein, whether it's from the fish or your chicken or your beef or, beef your, or lamb yeah, or whatever. Right, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So protein can come from different sources. Yeah. What are the highest plant-based proteins that are out there for those who are more vegan or vegetarian or those who may have converted to vegan and vegetarian? And they're uh, soy worried about is, that. Soy is a good choice. Uh, mm -hmm. That's because it's balanced. Uh. It has all mm. the essential and non-essential. Yeah. Okay. So soy is a good choice. Um, generally for vegans or vegetarian, you will have to eat a combination to get the complete protein profile. Okay. So for example, you need legumes plus grains. Okay, and grains as in rice or wheat. So like how so like the Indian diet, mm. Indians are gen a lot of a lot I'm sure a lot of uh, including yourself, right? Oh no, you, you do eat chicken. Your husband I do. <laughs> yes, yeah. my husband doesn't, yeah. Yeah, fine. So uh so yeah, in a in a normal typical uh, Indian vegetarian diet, you have the dal. Mm. And then it's normally eaten with, say, uh, your rice or chapati. Rice or chapati, yeah, which is wheat, mm. uh, which is grains, mm -hmm. right? So in yep. that combination, you do get a complete protein profile. Okay. Yeah. So it's, this is one way to combine, uh, which Indian food vegetarian is relatively healthy because yeah, in terms of protein, is complete because that's how people have been eating. Yeah. Right. What about things like vitamin B12 and stuff? Because that's not really high in a vegan or vegetarian diet. 
per se. Yes, that's uh, yes, correct. That's a little bit of a issue, especially with vegan and vegetarians, <laughs> because it comes commonly from meat. Yeah, yeah. So what do they do about that? So one way of getting that is through fermented foods. Ooh, okay. Yeah. So kimchi. Yeah, whether it's kimchi or you want to go German with sauerkraut or... Uh, Would Indian to... pickles... Have you eaten Indian pickles before? Uh, yes, yes, you can. Yes, that is good as well. Anything that is naturally fermented, the bacteria would have created a B12 for you. And if you had like... Uh, a yeast or candida allergy symptoms, mm-hmm. for example, would that still be okay to take despite having that? Generally, it's fine to get fermented products, uh, to eat fermented products, except for bread, which is mm. because for bread, there is a very high level of yeast. Most of the other fermented products, they have more bacteria than yeast, so it's still okay. Okay. All right. And then in terms of carbohydrates, now, uh, I mean, I'm only going to speak from an Indian heritage background, but like there are a significantly high amount, the numbers of people that I could tell you, not just in my family, just don't want to call them out, but like people in my, in my race who mm. tend to have a lot of diabetic or there are a lot of diabetes, there's a lot of blood pressure and cholesterol. Right. Um, where is this, is this coming from the fact that our method of cooking or is it because we're not balanced enough in certain of these nutrients essentially i would assume because it's generally high in carbohydrates uh i'm not sure about the milk portion like do you all really eat a lot of dairy in that sense i think it's more like so yogurt is a very common dairy based uh you know item that we consume um, right. Homemade yogurt, especially, is one of the big ones. Either buttermilk, which is the thinner version, or actual like full-on yogurt that we make. Mm-hmm. Um, other than that, I would say most of our food is definitely processed through frying of some kind, uh, mm-hmm. and and curries and and dal's and things like that. But there is a for southern India, especially, I would say a lot of it is rice-based, right? So your dosa, your idli, your you know, they're all rice-based. You, We eat lots of white rice as well. Um, yeah. Could those, like, could certain types of, even though the diet might be vegetarian, but the way that the diet is being constructed or made be contributing factors of maybe not getting enough nutrients in that method of cooking? Can the method of cooking affect the the, the obtaining of nutrients and vitamins? Okay, I, I won't specifically say that the Indian method of cooking yeah. is yeah affecting, but in general, your method yes. of cooking, yes, it can affect the nutrients. Yeah, can uh, you tell me what type of methods could affect, uh, affect it? Because obviously not just Indian cooking does all these methods, right? All, all, all <laughs> yes. the, the whole world cuisines all employ these methods. So what are probably, what are probably not the great, the, the amazing great things and what could be a better way of cooking maybe? Deep frying is not an amazing <laughs> cooking method, but if you're having it just once in a while, it's fine. But on everyday wise, um, that's not really a very good cooking method. Um, uh, and, stir frying and vegetables? Stir frying is daily fine. Thing? Yeah, stir frying is fine. Um, stir frying, saute. Um, when I say stir frying, I'm talking about home stir frying. Mm. Uh, I'm not okay. referring, you know, sometimes in a Chinese restaurant, there's like, like fire explosion everywhere. Yeah. It's super high. Not that type, not that mm. type of stir fry. I'm talking about a normal home cooking stir fry. So it's fine. Um, steam is fine. Soup based, stew based is fine. Now, some people boil the vegetables. Yes. And then they throw away the water. Yes. Right, uh, you it's do bad, bad. Yeah, you do. <laughs> you do lose uh, minerals and vitamins by throwing away the water. What? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. Mind blown because clearly every time I eat broccoli, <laughs> just throw the water away every time. So wait. So what do you do? You add it to a soup of some kind, maybe instead. You need to save the water, basically. Uh, or you steam the broccoli or the vegetables. That's better. You, so mm-hmm. the, the, the nutrients is still contained in the vegetables. 
Mm. Right? If you put it in the water, what happens is all these nutrients are water soluble. Yeah. Okay. So they will just leach out in the water and then we throw the water away. <laughs> Oh my god, right. Okay. So steaming it, um steaming it would be better. Grilling it is fine as well. Yeah, gr- uh, oven roasting it is fine oven too. Roasting. Right. Uh, okay. Saute this fine. kind of stuff, but then boiling and boiling but keep the water somehow. Use it <laughs> somewhere. Yeah, keep the water somehow. Use it somewhere. Yes. <laughs> oh but wow, okay. As long as there is a process uh you know, the moment we cut the vegetables, the moment we start cooking it, there will be loss of minerals somewhere. It's just how much is lost, that's all. Yeah, because we need to wash the vegetables off because of pesticides and herbicides, yes. right? So yes. is that also going to be di- taking away some of the minerals just because we're washing it or excessively washing it? Or we're just talking about specifically the boiling part? No, the cooking part. Yeah, the, Only cooking, the cooking part. Cooking. Yeah, okay. there will be, there definitely will be mineral lost. Mm. Or vitamin lost. Uh, the washing is fine. You can just it, you can just go ahead with it. It's not a problem. okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so I wanna, sorry, I just yeah. want to go back to the point where you uh, uh I think earlier you were saying uh, we were talking about the uh, fermented foods, mm. and then you were asking me about the yeast or the candida infection, uh, whether uh, allergies, food, yeah, allergies, whether fermented food would be suitable. Yeah. Now, in general, uh, as I was answering in general, just now in general, the fermented food would be fine. Uh, mm. If really someone has a very bad fungal or candida infection, then you want to stay away from uh, bread because of the commercial yeast. Not necessarily infection, but more of an allergy. So if they consume, you know, foods that have yeast as part of its ingredients, they get an allergic reaction, for example. Oh, that. Okay, then that is different. Then you want to stay away from it. Yes. Right. So then where would they get B12 then if they cannot do fermented and they don't eat meat? That's when you have to get rid of the fungus infection or the candida or whatever issue that they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, allergies. Allergy is normally due to uh, inflammation. So yeah, they'll have to control that first. Mm, Okay. That's opening a whole other topic about inflammation and how is that caused to <laughs> causing various issues, which maybe we'll need to do a separate podcast based on that. But um, I wanted to just quickly also talk about, you know, we you were, talk, we were talking about carbohydrates and we were talking about proteins. And we, I was going to talk about fats just really, really quickly. Um, there's a constant debate about, you know, healthy fats and bad fats and, <laughs> and all of this, you know maybe maybe made famous for people who are trying to lose weight clearly Mm -hmm. but i'm for me it's more of like the the way i the angle i'm seeing is that the healthy fats also aid for brain development and then you know helps in terms of like your your body processes your endocrine system and then that's also really vital for sleep which is what my department is right so if they're not having enough fats in their diet that's probably also contributing to their sleep issues Right. Um, so can we talk a little bit about good fats, bad fats? Yeah. Where do you get these fats? Um, kind of, yeah. Could you just skirt on that small fat ledge over there? <laughs> can. Um, the really bad fats that you want to avoid does not matter whether you have a health condition or not. Okay. okay just good. avoid uh, the hydrogenated and the trans fats. Okay, so give me an example of what that is, because I, like, let's say I don't know anything. What okay. what oil is that? <laughs> uh, those are found uh, in a lot of uh, in margarines mm-hmm. or any um, or any vegetable oil. Now, vegetable oil, whether it's olive oil, avocado oil, um, palm rice oil, bran, rice, rice bran, rice bran oil, oil yeah. Mm. Sunflower. You realize that all those vegetable oils are liquid at your room temperature. Mm-hmm. Right? So there's no way that they can be solid or semi-solid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if they are solid or semi-solid, they are essentially hydrogenated. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. So any form of uh, solid, semi-solid oils are hydrogenated. You want to avoid that. So basically things like 
I've seen this sort of like vegan butter, which is made out of coconut oil. Oh, uh, coconut oil is different because coconut oil is very high in saturated fats. Okay. All right. So uh, when you're very high in when it's very high in saturated fats, uh, then it there is a very close constituent to a norm in a, a normal uh, animal fats, which is solid at mm-hmm. room temperature. Mm. Right. I'm not sure if you notice if you have a bottle of coconut oil. Yeah. And if you put it in an aircon room, just a little bit colder, it will it will turn solid. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because it has it it turns solid very easily. It has a very high um uh, saturated fat, so it turns solid very easily. So coconut oil is is not in that category. Okay. What we are looking at is all the vegetable oils that is high in polyunsaturated or monounsaturated, so unsaturated fats. Hmm. Which is normally liquid at our room Singapore temperature. room temperature. Yeah. But you also get coconut oils that are liquid at room temperature. Yes. Uh, is correct. That but they still, are very okay. high in saturated, so they turn very, uh, they turn solid very fast, very easily. If the, if it was cooler, basically. Just a little bit cooler. That's all. Then it will turn right. solid. Yeah. Right. 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 So. Okay. So that's that's not a problem. The. The, the ones oil. that yeah, the ones that has the the ones that we have to be careful of are those that are liquid, mm. like really liquid because they are unsaturated naturally, right? And we try to make them into butter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so margarine definitely a no go. But like in terms of cooking oils, then what is probably the healthiest. I mean, you got everything, right? You got sunflower, you got peanut, you got rice bran, you got mixed vegetable oil, got corn. Um, what what's good? <laughs> what's the best for for uh, cancer? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I uh, I have this whole list that I give to them. So normally for cancer, I will tell them to choose oils that are low in omega six. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, so. If you have like mixed vegetable oil, right, mm-hmm. and you are not sure what is mixed inside, yeah. So those are the type of oils that will, I would tell people to avoid first because you're not sure what's mixed inside. Mixed vegetable mm. oil can be anything, right? Now another oil that I would ask people to avoid: canola. Hmm. Right. Okay. Now the reason why I say that is canola is the GMO version of grape uh, of rapeseed oil not grapeseed mm. sorry rapeseed r-a-p mm. yeah mm. so the original seed is rapeseed and then when it's genetically modified uh, the oil that is expressed from the genetically modified plant is called canola oil right so okay. that is that is widely available in the market yeah yeah, yeah? so that's one thing that you want to avoid because there are ve- it, there is a very um, there is a toxic substance in the oil, but it, but it is very um, in very small amount in the oil. But if you are eating the oil in uh, huge quantities, it can accumulate over a long period of time. So what kind of so maybe let's because there's so many varieties. What oils are better like? Out of the variety, is rapeseed oil better than to use? But you, you couldn't can. use it in high amounts of anything anyway because it's so expensive. Yeah, if you can find rapeseed or rice bran mm-hmm. locally for local cooking, uh, rice bran is fine. Okay. Uh, if you can find uh, palm oil, especially the red color ones. Okay. Yeah, so that would be fine too for normal local cooking. Uh, you can use coconut oil for curries if uh, for Chinese cooking a little bit tough because of the smell. Some people don't like it. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so if you don't like the smell of coconut oil, then you use back the um, use back the rice bran, rice bran. which is mm-hmm. odorless. Uh, grape seed in general is okay unless you have cancer. Then usually I will tell people not too much. Okay. Right, because of the uh, omega three six nine balancing mm. the amount. So normally for cancer, I would say not too much in limited quantities. But
but for a general population, you're generally healthy, don't have any issues, it's fine, you can use that. What about safflower or sunflower? Uh, normally, I wouldn't encourage because very high in omega-6. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but again, it is very widely used in everything. <laughs> yeah, it is. It yeah. Really is. Okay. So rice bran, good. Rapeseed, good. Olive oil, probably for light stuff or just salads. Uh, oh, there are some olive oil that can be used for cooking. Mm. Uh, the catch, I would say the catch. Lah. The catch mm -hmm. with olive oil is there's a lot of olive oil in the market that is not pure. Yeah. Right? Um, so yes. for now, it's really difficult for us to identify which is good and which is not. So I would say that if you go with olive oil from Australia or New Zealand, I know these two countries are not normally thought of as olive oil producers or olive oil. Yeah. But if you go with olive oil from Australia or New Zealand, um, yeah. though the quantity from these countries can be limited, but they would be the safest. They are usually pure. Right. Nothing okay. is mixed in. And the labeling is also very clear. It's stated very clearly that you can use this for cooking or not. Mm. Yeah, so it's very easy. So if you can find any of this from these two countries, uh, at, there, are a few, there are a few brands at uh, NTUC. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so not sure. Just get it from these two countries. <laughs> Otherwise, rice bran. I think rice bran is like definitely a, quite common enough that you can get it quite easily yes. compared to the other two. Yes. Okay, great. All right. And then I think finally, just to like wrap this up, uh, we're not seeing a lot of sunlight clearly by being locked in. And I am guessing <laughs> that is affecting a vitamin of some kind, if I'm not mistaken. Is it vitamin D, D yes, that is vitamin affected D. with the sun, right? And we need, because from a sleep sense, I, you need vitamin D to then help with your calcium and your magnesium and all of that. It mm. somehow works chemically in that, which I wouldn't know. But we're not getting vitamin D that much by sitting indoors a lot. So... What should we do? Should we be supplementing at this point of time? Or should we just literally just be getting out for a walk if, if that is enough? Is that enough? Vitamin D do store. Um, our mm. liver does keep vitamin D. So in, in, in the event that we have excess vitamin D, it is kept in the liver. And on the times when we don't have enough vitamin D, it is being released. Right? Right. So uh, before anyone jumped into the conclusion that they need to swallow supplements, huge copious amount of vitamin D before you do that. Uh, okay, vitamin D is one of those rare vitamins that you can actually test from your blood. <laughs> okay. So just right. get it tested first. If it's low, then you supplement. But if it's in a normal rate, uh, then you don't have to do anything. Just let it be. It's fine. Then on a yearly basis, when you do a blood test, when you do your annual medical checkup, you can just tell your doctor, I would like to add vitamin D. Mm. That's fine. And should we be asking our doctors for our yearly checkups to be doing like in-depth just coverage of all our minerals and vitamins just to make sure that everything's on top of its game? Or... Is it only when you think like, oh, I actually have massive health problems. I have to wait for that. Like, just like an annual checkup, could we do it with, with these? Uh, there is not all vitamins or minerals can be checked in the, from the blood. Yeah. Yeah, which is also the reason why the doctors don't include it or the labs don't include it because not everything can be checked. Mm. But... Um, but the common ones that are included would be the calcium, the potassium, because it will be included under part of your kidney or renal profile testing. Yeah. Yeah, so those are the common ones. Uh, the one that I would sometimes uh, or yeah, ask my client, especially older clients where, we, where I know that they are not going out a lot, they are spending a lot of time indoor. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, vitamin D is something that I sometimes would ask them to do on a yearly basis. Yeah. Yeah, just to check it out. And it's also good for immune boosting, especially mm. in this period. You do mm. need your Ds for immune boosting. 
Yeah. I mean, a lot of people talk about C for immunity, but they don't really talk about the D part. Yeah. Uh, mm. C, D, A, uh, and zinc. Mm. Yeah, this would be the few common ones that you need for immune. Okay. Yeah. And especially since we're not really seeing sunlight a lot, and that also plays a lot into our body clock, should people be looking at, you know, taking supplements at this point of time to just to counter the fact that they're being indoors a lot, or it's better to probably consult you or consult someone like you to before they embark on supplementation? Supplementation. If they are just going to take in a short term, uh, in, a, in a normal dose, say like um, 1,000 IU a day, mm. yeah, a normal dose for the short term, say for about a month or two, it's fine. They can go ahead if they, uh, if they know that this is circuit breaker, I'm locked down in my condo, I'm not going anywhere, then go ahead, it's okay. Mm. But if you are intending to take very high doses, like 10,000 IU, then I would say, please consult someone before you start popping vitamin D pills. Yeah. What about other vitamins in general, like C and A or, I don't know, calcium, all these other mineral also? It comes in a multivite, it's fine. You can... And you can take a multivite for a long term or should it be consumed only for a certain number of months? Uh, you can take it in a long term for multivites. Okay, and the, the other amount, one should be mm -hmm. yeah the amount in a multi uh, the the amount of vitamins in a multivite because everything there's so many things in that one little tablet or one yeah. little capsule, so everything is just in a very small dose. Mm. Yeah, so it's so just that's a enough. supplement your yeah. diet. Yeah, it's just a supplement your diet. So your diet still plays a very important role. <laughs> Right, right. Okay, okay. But then in terms of anything else, like if you're taking additional calcium or magnesium and all of this, that's probably better to be done under the supervision of a yes. licensed professional. Right, right. Okay. So we have, I have seen, a, uh, I've seen people taking like overdosing themselves with calcium that they don't even yeah. realize. <laughs> what happens if you do overdose yourself with calcium, for uh, example? The, the two cases that I've seen, their blood pressure shot up. Hmm. Yeah, I've so seen two cases where they accidentally overdose themselves with calcium and the blood pressure went up. Um, right. We didn't do any, I didn't do anything. I just asked them to stop and rebalance, balance it back with magnesium. And then I think, oh, it just takes about three to five days and then the blood pressure goes back to normal. Right. Okay. This is all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The recent okay. case I've seen was a lady overdosing herself in fish oil. She has a lot of underlying health issues. She has other health issues, right? Um, but she was not aware of it. And then she overdosed herself with fish oil and her blood pressure dropped so low that she fainted. Okay, wow. Why? Yeah. How can you overdose yourself with fish oil? She had multiple supplements and all of them has fish oil. I see. Okay. Uh, so that's the danger when you start combining different formulas or standalone supplements and you, you're not really, mm. you're not sure what you're doing. So she had like three different formula. Uh, sorry, she had yeah, three different formula and two of them had fish oil in it. And then she added another fish oil on top. Right. Standalone okay. fish oil. And they are all high dose dosing mm. formula. Yeah. In terms of a general person, just a, a regular multivitamin should be more than enough. And if they wanted to add some sort of like omega-3, whatever, omega fish yeah. oil or vegetarian then, equal yes. capsule, that's enough yep. for, the long, for, for a long-term long su yes. supplementation? Yep. Okay. Okay. And anything that's, you know, very specific, like a magnesium or calcium or zinc or anything should be under a guidance of a licensed practitioner. Yeah. Or, uh, or at least someone or at least, yeah, or at least someone who is trained and know that what they are taking. Mm. Um, and yes. And the other thing I wanted to highlight is also your lifestyle. Because what yeah. I'm talking about here is very general. I'm assuming that someone is either sedentary or just moderately active. Yeah. Three times of exercise a week. So the guidelines of a multivite, uh, maybe fish oil, maybe some uh, vegetarian or green capsule or green powder would be good enough. 
But if you're someone who is very, very active, uh, you do weightlifting or you are involved in physical labor work or you're training for a competition, then it's, it's a different story. Then you will need much, much more nutrients. Right. All okay. Right. So because your totally, body's expending a lot more energy yeah. out. So right. it's, a, it's a totally different, yeah, different arrangement altogether. Okay. Okay. So I think in short, definitely people, if, if you're not of the sitting at home and being sedentary and once in a while exercising, if you've got quite a demanding physical, like active lifestyle, whether it's through work, whether you're a fitness trainer or you have, you know, you're very into fitness or you are a very movement based work, uh, job personnel, then your profile should be a little bit looked into to make sure that you're getting enough nutrients in your in your system because your body just needs to move more. So clearly it needs much more energy um, comparatively that way, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That was really interesting. Well, I think uh, for today, I think that <laughs> that's quite a lot of information that I think we've thrown at our listeners and our viewers. So I wanted to thank Catherine again very much for all this wonderful knowledge. Thank you, Catherine. No problem. Really, thank you for really having nice. me today. Thank you so much for joining me today. And I cannot wait to talk maybe more about, ooh, we should talk like specific things next time. Like vitamin this and you know juicing and smoothies and how much to oh, juice yeah, and how much to not there. juice like yes i think that's the next uh that that would be the next thing is like very specifics on like uh dietary formulas and stuff like that but we'll we'll come to that in another episode i think this is quite a lot already for for one session sure yes <laughs> awesome <laughs> thanks so much no problem 